Good afternoon, folks. My name is David Dooney from Mouse Group. Um, firstly, I'll take a moment to acknowledge that today we're meeting virtually on the lands of many different Aboriginal people and clans. Um, I'd personally like to acknowledge that I'm coming from the lands of the Willem clan of the Wurundjeri people down by the Mary Creek, who are the traditional custodians of this land. I pay respect to their elders, both past and present, and I extend that respect to any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people virtually present today. Welcome to this webinar. Um, it's, a, it's the result of a great suggestion by one of the attendees at some in-person events that we held in Sydney and Melbourne that we could extend the reach of uh, this topic uh, beyond um, those cities and to, to people who weren't able to make it uh, to those in-person events. Um, I'm from NAUS Group, an international management consulting firm and joined by colleague from NAUS Group, Hamish Ride and a uh, colleague from Lightcast, um, the artist formerly known as Burning Glass, um, providers of real-time labour market analytics, uh, Layla O'Kane. Um, Today, we're going to hear from both Layla and Hamish, um, and then have some time for uh, Q&A at the end. So firstly, I'd like to introduce uh, Layla. Um, Layla is a senior economist at, and research director on the economics team at Lightcast. Um, Lightcast uses labor market analytics um, for many reasons, but Layla's role is about furthering public policy. She's recently researched the topics of AI and jobs, remote work growth, entrepreneurship and career opportunities for military spouses, the return on investment of industry credentials. Um, she has a BA in economics from the University of Pennsylvania and an MPA in, from the Harvard Kennedy School. Over to you, Layla. Thank you so much, David. It's great to be here. And happy Valentine's Day from the US. Hope everybody had a good Valentine's Day yesterday. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, can everybody see this? Thumbs up from Hamish or David? Perfect. So thanks for having me. Today, we're gonna to be talking a little bit about big labor market data and the future of work, which sounds like a very big topic, but hopefully it will um, be clearer for you at the end. So uh, I'll be talking a little bit about Lightcast, who we are, what big labor market data even is. And then I'll be looking at three different case studies. Uh, the first using job posting data to try to understand how occupations have changed over time in terms of the skills that they demand. The second would be on social profile data, helping us understand how adult learners and people who are going back to school, perhaps after some time in the workplace, can use those education opportunities to further their careers. And then looking at some global data and understanding some big future of work trends. So what is Lightcast? Who are Lightcast? We use real-time data to help build and transform the workforce. Our main thing is that we focus on big data. So we use um, a lot of scraping models to get big labor market data from online sources. We marry that with labor market information from public data sources. Um, and we do some modeling on top of that to try to help there be a common language across multiple categories of labor market data. We are based in Boston, Massachusetts and in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, and I think actually we have just over 700 employees now, which is very exciting. Um, some of whom are based in the US and Canada, like myself, others are based in Australia and New Zealand, um, and then also folks in the UK, Italy and India. So what kind of problems do we work to solve? The first one is bridging the gap with skills. So I think a lot of different players in this space talk about skills, but maybe with a different language. So if I'm a hiring manager, I might think of um, Python as a skill, whereas if I'm building an education program, I might think of data science as a skill and might not sort of connect the dots between the two. And so we try to make sure that we can bridge that gap, provide a common language across labor supply and demand so that those two can meet effectively. We also 
Secondly, try to provide labor market information. So a lot of um, stakeholders in this space just don't have the information they need to make decisions that can improve efficiencies. And so that's putting together big labor market data as well as publicly available information on job demand and other employment statistics that can help people understand the labor market better. We're focused heavily on the future of work and also on helping to future-proof workforces and people. Um, and so things like technological disruption, green jobs, remote work, artificial intelligence, maybe chat GPT, these are all changing how work and the working world works. And we try to understand those trends and see how they will affect different stakeholders. Um, and lastly, but not least, we are working towards a labor market that works for everyone. So right now there might be folks who don't have the right skills, who haven't had the right opportunities, who aren't given those opportunities or who have been displaced due to changes in industries or other trends. Um, and so we're really working to make sure we, we kind of help support people have mobility, equity, um, as well as diversity and inclusion. So what is big labor market data? What we do to collect that is we aggregate data from online job and networking sites. So places like um, LinkedIn or online job boards, um, even individual employer websites. If you put a job posting up publicly available, we collect that and we deduplicate those sources across um, many different profiles and postings so that we make sure we're only counting a job posting that's up on an employer website as well as up on an aggregator website one time. And we parse it and standardize it so that we can collect all the information available from that text. So we look at things like what is the job title? Who is the employer? What are some of the technical and foundational skills that are being required based on this job posting? What are the certifications involved? Um, what is the education or experience requirement? And then any salary information available. And we do the same thing for profiles. So if you look at somebody's professional profile that's available online. You can see what are the jobs that they worked at, what were those job titles, employers, and the education or experience that they have that they've put out there. And we use this to try to understand the labor market in real time. Across many different types of communities, we work with companies and other organizations to help support this work. So uh, we do a lot of work for big international organizations, for governments, for talent organizations and for education providers. And where do I sit? So I think David mentioned, but I'm on the economics team. And what that means is I sit in a, a small team that does uh, some internal reports. So these are customer reports based on things that we think are, are interesting, showcasing uses of our data, trying to understand big trends. We'll talk about a bunch of those today. We also do some commission reports with partners and other foundations. We recently, for example, did one with the Australian Computer Society on the state of IT in Australia. And then we also do partnerships with other researchers to try to support their research and also bring together their data with ours. Um, and so recently we've done some of those with BCG and Harvard Business School. So the first topic I'm gonna to talk about today is how big data can be used to understand how occupations and skills are changing. We have seen that skills have changed substantially within jobs just in the last five years alone. So what we did is we looked at exactly the same job in 2016 and then again in 2021. And we tried to understand, okay, what are the top 20 skills that are being required? Um, and we saw that the average change across all jobs was 37%, which means that just in the top 20 requested skills, almost, half of those have changed in the last five years. So if I was a, a marketing specialist five years ago and I'm still a marketing specialist today, that doesn't mean that I need exactly the same skills. And in fact, I've probably learned a lot of skills on the job. We put all of this data into an index. So we looked across the entire labor market and we said, okay, for every job, how much skill disruption has happened based on what we can see in our data. Um, and on the one hand, all the way at the bottom, so not a lot of change is mystery shopper. So mystery shopper has really stayed the same. We haven't seen a lot of skill change happen for mystery shopper. Um, as we kind of move up and to the left, so up the index to the left on this graph, we see a little bit more skill change happen. So um, somewhere you know in the bottom, we move to cook, air traffic controller. Right in the middle, we have CEO, which I think continues to need a lot of strong leadership skills. 
um, even if some of the content uh, of the CEO job has changed. Um, and then we move up and we keep going and we see roles like a talent acquisition or recruiting manager. You know, these roles have changed a lot um, in the skills that they need to understand so that they can effectively recruit new talent, especially as technology has, has changed this. Um, and all the way at the top, we see data engineer. So data engineer is the job that has changed the most in the last five years in terms of the skills that are required. And so we looked at, well, what's really driving all of this change? What are some of the skill trends? And what we see are four big trends. The first one is digital skills coming into non-digital occupations. So um, we talk a lot about digital skill growth, and I think people tend to focus on jobs that are in the IT sector. But in fact, we're seeing a lot of digital skill requirements in other sectors as well. Um, things like in manufacturing, for example, uh, manufacturing roles now require knowledge of AutoCAD or 3D modeling. So these digital skills that weren't really an important part of those roles before, but are now. Another example of this is an advertising sales representative. So um, they used to need to know fewer CRM softwares or things like Salesforce, and now that's become an integral part of the role. The second trend is sort of the flip side of that coin. So soft skills coming into more digital occupations. Um, and we're seeing that with the increase in technological capacity, uh, we are now complementing some digital roles with additional human or soft skills. So in a digital job, you might need to know programming languages, you might need to know a lot of technical skills, but you now need to augment those with things like communication, leadership, teamwork, problem solving. And as we see uh, technology able to replace a little bit more perhaps of the, of the coding skills that people have had, we're gonna see these human skills become even more important in order for those roles to sort of uh, communicate the results of models, get buy-in from other stakeholders, make strategic decisions using data rather than um, sort of a pure technical or digital job. The third big trend that we're seeing is visual communication or data visualization. Uh, the use of data visualization has increased across the labor market with roles like um, an actuary now needing to know something like Python or Tableau. Um, and I think that in, in many roles that used to be more focused on data analysis, they now need to also be able to sort of communicate the results of that visually out to other team members. And the last one is social media skills. So. Um, what you aren't shown on here, but we've actually seen more recently is that not only have social media skills grown overall, but so have specific social media skills like TikTok. So, you know, maybe that wasn't a technology that existed five years ago to the same extent that it does now at least, um, but these are becoming more and more required. And for roles, even like a receptionist, for example, or a hotel desk clerk, they might run that business's social media and they need to know how to use those tools to do things like promote their business, but also sometimes to post jobs or sort of do basic job functions, they're using these tools. The second uh, case study that I wanna walk you through uses our social profile data. And we look to understand how continuing education opportunities can provide more lifelong learning outcomes using the profile data. So this is a US case study. And the motivation here is that in the US at least um, for universities, enrollment has been declining. Um, and so we are helping to see, well, what are some of the other populations that maybe universities don't always consider marketing to that could benefit from increased education and could have some more opportunity uh, with that increased education. And so what we did is we looked at approximately 125 million social profiles in the United States, and we tried to find people who we would consider to be an adult learner. So uh, maybe they did some school or work, but they didn't have a bachelor's degree in the first period. So they were not with a bachelor's degree, they were working. In the second period, they go back to school. They end up with a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree, um, which is a two-year degree here in the US. And in the third period, they go back to work. And we tried to see, well, what was the outcome of them going back to school, getting some additional skilling or upskilling from that school period, and then going back into the labor market. And what we saw is that they had a 22% higher upward mobility rate relative to people who did not go back to school. So 56% of those adult learners 
experienced upward mobility relative to 46% of non-learners. We also saw that they had a substantial increase in salary. So the increase in salary after going back to school was 140% larger than those who did not go back to school, which is what you would hope to see, but it was great to validate that the return on education is really high, even for people who are doing this kind of mid-career later in life. Um, we also saw that associate degrees in some cases are better than bachelor's degrees for upward mobility. So again, associates is a two-year degree here and a bachelor's degree is a four-year degree. And so you might assume that um, the four-year degree is always better, but in some cases, in some fields, um, for example, in engineering related fields, an associate's degree that was more focused in that grant higher upper mobility than a more general bachelor's degree like business or psychology. Um, and lastly, we saw that upward mobility was happening for these adult learners in industries that you might not expect. So in the US, there's a really uh, built out healthcare uh, education system that has a lot of sort of certifications and uh, components of education that allow for greater upward mobility. And so we expected to see higher returns in health, but actually, and in and information, but we actually saw very high returns also in places like utilities or the construction and manufacturing industries, um, which was so surprising. And I think shows that there's upper mobility opportunities across a wider range of industries than perhaps people automatically think of. The last uh, case that I wanna share with you is our, from our 2023 Global Talent Playbook. And this is focusing on some global trends that we're seeing sort of shift the nature of work across many different countries and regions. Um, despite some people being concerned about the contrary, uh, remote work looks like it is here to stay. So uh, in the US, we've seen substantial increases in remote work and those have not died down. Um, and on the right hand side, we looked at a similar trend in Australia, and you can see that we don't see this coming back down from, from where it has been. And so I think despite some sort of media uncertainty about whether or not remote work was going to remain the norm, we haven't seen a lot of companies reverting back in terms of their job postings to not allowing for remote work. Um, it's not only focused in high tech occupations or industries. I think that we often think that it is, but we've seen a lot of fast growing remote opportunities as in across a wide range of roles. Um, so the, the top occupations that allow for remote work, at least in the US, are kind of what you would expect. Web developer, video game designer, computer programmer. These are all very sort of high tech roles. But in terms of growth on the right hand side, the ones that we've seen growing substantially in the last few years, um, include things like a tax manager or a occupational therapy assistant or a medication aide. So these are roles that maybe you might not think could have been done remotely, but people have innovated um, throughout the pandemic when they had to. And now these roles are increasingly being offered as remote options. We're also looking at green, green job growth. And so we've seen substantial demand for green jobs and a lot of growth has happened in the United States as well as across um, Europe, I don't have the data for Australia up here, but I am working on that as well and hope to see similar, I expect to see similar trends, especially as the policy environment um, across the globe continues to sort of push for more growth in green jobs. And then the last trend we've been seeing is artificial intelligence. So um, ChatGPT is not included in here yet, but it will be soon. We looked at a bunch of roles that required artificial intelligence skills, including things like machine learning or data science or automated vehicle driving or robotics. And this is what we've seen over time, substantial growth, um, especially in the US, UK and Spain, also substantial growth in Australia since 2014 in terms of AI jobs, um, meeting sort of many other countries in terms of growth. Uh, and we're gonna expect to continue to see this as different AI technologies become available. The last thing I wanted to mention is sort of labor shortages and how this affects some of these global trends. So um, we've looked at a couple different ways in which employers were sort of trying to introduce more, um, more incentive essentially for workers to apply to a role. Um, and so some of the things that we've been seeing is that 
now uh, employers are maybe more likely to include a salary range or post a wage directly on a job posting so make that information publicly available and that can encourage workers to apply because there's some transparency there right and they understand well what's the what's the wage I could be making here and so we've seen substantial growth in that um, in the US as well as in Australia and then a uh, sign on bonuses so some employers have been offering sign-on bonuses as well to try to attract more talent. Um, we've seen that especially happening in um, non-degree postings in the US, so uh, roles that don't require a bachelor's degree at all. Um, and I don't have it broken up by degree for Australia, but we've seen really similar trends where when facing labor shortages, um, a lot of companies have been saying, well, let's try to add a sign-on bonus to entice more people to apply. Um, and so I think we're gonna continue to see some of this as in specific industries, labor shortages continue. Those are my case studies. Just a really quick, what's next for Lightcast? What are we up to? So um, upcoming reports, I'm working currently on a global talent acquisition strategy report to try to help companies understand sort of what the global talent labor market looks like and how for certain roles they can take advantage of remote work and potentially hire people outside of the region or the country that they work in. Um, we're looking at some better bets for program development, so trying to help education providers uh, develop programs that are more aligned with the labor market and understand what are the programs that are likely to succeed. And then we're doing some more work on our artificial intelligence topic, especially in Europe, and hoping to bring that more to the APAC region as well, um, trying to understand specifically what are different types of artificial intelligence employers doing, especially big ones versus small ones. So if I'm you know, Google, that might be different from a boutique machine learning firm, and how do they think of skill differences for those roles? We're trying to increase some global data and products as well. So we're adding more countries to our data availability and looking at more cross-country comparisons. Um, and then we do some live analyses of government data, and we're developing some skill sets to bring those to Australia as well. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thanks very much, Layla. Um, to bring an Australian perspective on similar data, particularly um, the use of social profile data, my colleague um, Hamish Wright is going to give a presentation. Hamish leads NASA's education and skills practice, and he's a pretty rare colleague who really works really at the interface of um, education, employers, and policy makers. Um, and he's a rare individual who's equally comfortable kind of pouring over the data that we're going to talk to today, but also out consulting with employers in, in the Mali about skill shortages and then working with policy policymakers to solve those challenges. So it's a delight to um, bring Hamish's uh, unique perspective on how we can use uh, new sources of data um, to support Australia's human capital. So over to Hamish. Thanks, David. <clears throat> Just bear with me while I get my screen up. Hopefully everyone can, can see that. Um, look, thank you, David, and welcome everyone. It, it is great to share some of our internal research uh, with you this, this morning. And today as David outlined, I'd really like to speak to you about mobility, um, particularly in the context of careers just how we build human capital. Hopefully you can sort of still see my image on the screen here, but um, I'm sure you hard find it hard to believe that the person on screen is my father. He recently passed away and it got me thinking about careers and what do we really know about them? What struck me was the diversity of the career he had, yet at the same time, how important each step was in shaping who he became. I remember the attention the FYA report on the New Work Smarts received when they found a young person today will experience a portfolio career potentially having 17 different jobs over five careers in their lifetime. Yet here on the screen is someone who commenced their working life 60 years ago with a similar career. I'm also sure that if we each look back at our own careers, we find a similar story spanning different industries and occupations. That got me thinking about what impact do these different experiences have on an individual and how important is it to Australia's overall stock of human capital? Reflecting on my father's career, like the slight family resemblance between me and my dad, 
In each job, there was a resemblance in the skills he was prior and next jobs. Some simply carried over, while others he brought with him, offering new skills that were less common in the role. The skills that he learned as a performing mus musician and officer in the army stayed with him throughout his career, but were augmented in each stage of his career journey until his last job as CEO of the Cancer Council of Tasmania. That is, and if you don't count recreational fishermen or ride on lawnmower hobbyists as occupations. Much as our DNA contains the instructions for our physical development, evolving over generations, skills provide the instructions for our career, evolving at each stage. While significant investment and research occurs in identifying and targeting the genes that can impact our physical development, the same cannot be said for skills in their relationship to jobs and careers. Hope that some of what I share today can stimulate some further thinking in this space. So let's start at the beginning. When we look at the data, 43% of new workers in 2021 were employed in three key industries, accommodation, food, retail, health and social assistance. While there's a strong educational focus in terms of supporting health and social assistance, the same can often not be said between accommodation, food and retail. Yet this is where many people either get their start or restart their career in, in the economy. I should sort of note, in terms of when I talk about new workers, these are workers not employed 12 months ago. So may include recent migrants, people who have an extended absence from the workforce, or people who might be starting their career or setting up in their career. Although when we look at new workers, nearly all industries took on more new workers compared to past years in 2021. I think what's most encouraging and interesting is that we've seen industries such as information, media and telecommunications, financial, assistance, uh, financial services, electricity, gas, waste, water services take on substantially more new workers than their long-term average. This is reflecting a change in terms of both the labour market as we sit close to or at full employment, but also represents the need for these these employers to think differently, both about how in individuals land in these industries, but also how you develop them given different recruitment patterns. It's also interesting to look at how dependent industries are on new workers. And we can see to the right here, by the left of the screen, accommodation, food re and retail, there's nearly one new worker for every four to five existing workers. Whereas if we look across most, un most other industries, that ratio is more sort of in the nine to 12 uh, bracket. This puts a significant burden on individuals in those industries to really equip individuals with the skills they need to have a successful career. I think every employer we speak to talks about employability. These skills are gained in the accommodation food retail for many of us. So what happens next? Every year, around a fifth of the workforce, around 2.8 million Australians change jobs. That's roughly evenly split between those being promoted, so changing jobs within their existing employer, and those changing jobs to a new, new employer. Notably, in 2021, after the, the lockdowns of COVID, we did see a bit of a spike in the percentage of people moving jobs. And the rate of change varies by industry, with the greatest difference to the rate of promotion. As we can see on, on the left, um, you know, agriculture and other, oh, sorry, agriculture in particular, see a relative small load, um, rate of promotion, primarily because of the structure of the business and the nature of the business that's involved there. Whereas on the right, we can see that um, much higher rates of promotion, particularly within the public, administra um, public administration, mining and financial services than we see elsewhere in the economy, uh, as well as education. Of workers who change jobs, more than half change industry, but only a third change occupation. This is really illustrative of the portability of skills across industries, with occupations um, often a stepping stone to new roles. And also we see that workers more likely to change occupation also generally more likely to change industry. For employers struggling to fill existing positions, it's clear that if you lose, if an employer gets to the point of changing, there's a risk that you not just only lose them to you as a business, you may also lose them from you as an industry. So if we look at 2021, who are the winners and who are the losers in the tight labor market? 
what we can see is there's a clear set of industries uh, that in 2021 were net exporters and that they lost more work, more people left that industry than joined. And on the right, we see those of the importers. People essentially were able to draw workers from other industries uh, to meet their, their needs. Over time, the trend becomes more distinct. And what we can start to see is there's different types of industries that play different roles in our economy. So on the left, we see what we're calling launchpad industries. These are the industries that are ultimately responsible for many Australians and others getting their start in the Australian economy. We then have a set of dynamic industries. These are industries that over time, the trends may change due to um, economic cycles or different cycles within those industries or different demands for the workers that occur, such as in the IT industry. On the right, we see these industries that are generally, um, most years, are importers of labour. We call these destination industries, as generally when people land in these industries, they stay in the, these industries. If I was being less kind, you could also call these vampire industries. These are the industries sucking the workforce out of every other industry in Australia. So that's what we can learn from the traditional data, but what can we learn from alternative data sources? So as Layla mentioned, Lightcast provides a range of data sources, which now says expert in, in its application. One data set that we've recently received access to is a set of social profile data for Australia, which includes roughly 4 million distinct profiles um, and about 10 million jobs covering both education and experience. I won't go into the, the details, which you can see on screen. In terms of the data set, we believe this provides really important additional insight into the labour market. And while many people sort of ask, well, of course, it's going to be skewed um, because of the it's an online data set. We do find that, yes, while it's skewed, the data set does actually include quite large populations across most occupations, even down to a jurisdictional level, although it does get thin in some areas uh, for our smaller jurisdictions. If we go down to ANSCO 4, we roughly find about 140 occupations at ANSCO 4 have greater than 10,000 distinct profiles. There are very few, if any, uh, panel or even surveys that can provide this richness of data. What type of insights can it tell us? First thing we looked at is, is really around the median job length. And what we found that for most occupations, they have a medium job length of less than two years. So first pause here. What this means is roughly 50% of employees will stay in their role for two years or less. As an organisation, what are you doing for those individuals as they near that two year milestone to retain and ensure that they can uh, progress in their careers without losing, you know, increasing that risk of being, them being lost to your business? We also note that some occupations are more mobile than others. In terms of the profile, software and application programs are likely to have twice as many uh, job changes from their first occupation than in complementary health uh, therapists. We also see that different occupations enable different transitions. I might just sort of spend a little bit of time on this slide to just outline what you're seeing here. So what we've plotted here is on the vertical axis, it's the diversity of career transitions from an occupation. So that is everyone in that occupation, where do they go after? How many different occupations uh, do they pathway or transition to? On the horizontal axis, with the diversity of career transitions to an occupation. So that's how many different occupations are people in before they um, are employed in, in a given occupation. What it starts to do is reveal four different sort of groups of occupations. So on the bottom left, we see what we're calling more career jobs. These are jobs that are essentially you really are entering them into for life. You know, generally people go into these and then they can have a, a full, fulsome career within that occupation. In the top left, we see what we call gateway jobs. Think of these as we've really got a laneway to and a freeway from. Yeah, there might be only one pathway to it, but once you obtain that qualification or obtain that experience in that occupation, a plethora of opportunities open up for you um, that enable you to choose a range of different occupations and careers. It takes us across to the, the right hand, uh, top right hand corner, which we're calling pivot jobs. 
These are occupations that many of us will pass through in their career. There are many ways in, many ways from, but importantly, they, they're a key stepping stone for many careers and probably the majority of Australians at some point in their career. And the final, essentially calling capstone jobs. These are jobs that have many pathways to, but not many pathways from. And I think it's important to look at these because in two ways, in some cases, they are generally a capstone in that they are jobs that people aspire to, and that's an end point for a career and something that people will be quite happy to stay in for the rest of their working life. But unfortunately, many of these jobs are actually more dead end jobs. They're jobs that people work their way to and then find themselves stuck. And I think if you just look at the types of occupations in the bottom right hand corner, there's also a very strong correlation to where we see precarious work, where there's an imbalance between the power of employer and the individual because they're just, the opportunities dry up for those individuals to pursue different occupations. What about specific occupations? So within the industries, retention by occupation can vary significantly. What we're showing here is uh, a subset of health and human services occupations and the percentage of people who moved to the same or different job in any given year. So as you can see, an occupational therapist, once they obtain into that occupation, they generally stay there. Whereas for nursing support and personal care workers, only around 10 to 20% of workers will stay, if they move, uh, will continue to work in that occupation, which obviously creates a significant challenge given the importance of that sector to Australia's wellbeing. It's not unique to health either. You know, this is an example of engineering occupations, whereas mining engineers more likely stay in the profession, engineering managers, will move into a variety of roles. And this is again, the nature of the occupation with, which I'll go into a bit further. So here are a couple of more specific examples. So registered nurse is a really good example of a capstone type occupation in that what we see is that once people become a registered nurse, most of their subsequent career transitions are within the registered nurse uh, occupation. Well, you can see there are a number of other pathways they pursue there's very few from, and the light, overwhelming majority is within the occupation. We compare this with something like an engineering manager, where we see a much smaller percentage um, staying with, moving within the engineering manager role. We also see a quite uh, different variety in terms of the transitions to, transitions from. So this sort of shares more of the characteristics of a pivot, pivot occupation or pivot job. Finally, I just wanted to sort of share some information around, uh, further information around tenure. So in addition to looking at tenure for uh, existing workers, we also looked at differences between those that are starting an occupation for the first time and those that are moving into an occupation um, as a subsequent job. And what we generally found is that you generally have about an extra six months for individuals in their first job than you would otherwise if that person has prior experience. Uh, in that occupation. Again, why this is important is actually starting to shape those learning and development initiatives to ensure both um, to retain and grow uh, individuals in line with their career objectives, but also where they are. Just to sort of show, um, we also see a similar pattern with engineering managers, slightly longer tenure, but um, not significantly uh, significant. So in conclusion, to build human capital effectively, we must better understand flows across a career. This class reflects our overall stock of talent. If we're to build the human capital we need, we must understand labour flows, not just when they leave the tap of initial or subsequent education, but how the flow changes as it falls to the glass, how different flows mix and any spills or leaks that might occur along the way or after it hits the glass. The labour market is dynamic. I think everyone here recognises education and experience is the most powerful learning. Each job, industry or occupation change is a point of inflection in someone's career. For many, the potential of these changes is untapped. As with the double helix of DNA, combining the strands of experience and education into a single set of information can be a powerful enabler. And bringing together traditional and alternative data sources is the first step to achieve this and shed light on what happens within individual career journeys helping plan and shape our response appropriately. 
Recognising and harnessing this dyna dynamism is the next step in building Australia's human capital. Like geneticists harnessing DNA, we'll need to tread carefully. The potential for unintended consequences is high, with different employers, occupations and industries competing for talent. But our work with industry and governments to better understand and respond to pressing labour and skill shortages, employers to secure the talent they need to prosper, and education providers to optimise their course portfolio in response to learner and employer needs, demonstrates the value of this information. Being more informed is the first step in ensuring our collective action delivers Australia the human capital it requires to meet skill and workforce shortages now and to drive our growth and prosperity. Thank you for the opportunity to share some of our research with you today and please reach out if you're interested in a further conversation or would like more information on how NAUS may be able to support you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Hamish. Um, so now we have the opportunity for audience uh, Q&A. Um, if you would like to ask a question, can you please put it in the Q&A uh, button down at the bottom of the Zoom screen, uh, not the chat button. Um, while we're waiting for people uh, to pose their questions, one question I have, Habish, and it's not a good question because I don't know the answer to it, but I'm hoping you or Layla have, have the answer. Is, is mobility in the labour market a good or a bad thing? It's a good question. Um, look, I think mobility is really critical because obviously, you know, if we look at a full employment economy, which Australia is at the moment, it's the efficiency of which we can move skills around um, is really about um, how the economy grows and how we actually support economic growth in, in general. So as a, at a macro level, that mobility is really important to make sure that we are using our scarce labour, scarce skills um, as as we can. I think at an individual level, it's also really important. You know, as individuals, we, we value growth. You know, we always strive to grow and learn and um, the flip side of mobility is barriers. Um, but those barriers are essentially barriers to progression, barriers to skill acquisition, which um, I don't know about other people on the call. For me, that growth is what keeps me engaged and interested in work. So I think that mobility, or even just the threat of mobility enables me to continue to, I think enables individuals to continue to um, maintain fulfilled uh, through their working careers. Layla, do you have anything to add? To yeah, I think, I mean, I, I agree. And I think um, it's important to think about mobility maybe differently across skill building and, and as, as an opportunity to skill build than sort of maybe in some roles where you might be forced to take the same type of job across multiple employers, perhaps because you don't feel like you have more opportunities. So I think mobility is good when it provides that skill building and provides that upwardly mobile opportunity. And it's good to have a flexible workforce. It might not be good if you're just jumping from one low wage job to another without that opportunity to sort of upskill and get a better career option for yourself. Great. Thanks, Layla. Um, so a question from an attendee. Thanks for two really interesting presentations. And I agree, I, I helped Hamish put those slides together last year and I totally had forgotten about all of them. And I, so it was great to come back to it. It was really, uh, it was really interesting, including that very uh, complicated one of the diversity to and from transitions, but happy to uh, follow up separately with anyone who wants to know more about that. But do you have any thoughts on the barriers for people aged over 55 being brought back into the workforce after they've left? Um, maybe Layla would be good for you to start with that because I think it might be different in Australia and the US where people, US people seem to have to keep working a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we, we won't get into that, but yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there are some challenges to anyone who has left the workforce and is trying to come back and that, that can be across ages right but um as we kind of saw skills are changing very quickly in jobs and i think there's there can be some technological hurdles as well as just other sort of types of skills that um, are being increasingly asked for in roles but i don't think that that's a problem specifically for folks over 55 that's just kind of the, the labor market that we all li live in now and i think everyone will need to sort of think more uh 
in a more concerted way about their own upskilling opportunities, even within their own roles. Um, that being said, you know, I think we did see a little bit in some of the uh, data that I presented that if you left the workforce for an education opportunity, you have some really good prospects coming back. And so I think if you are looking to come back into the workforce, there are some really sort of nice ways that you can maybe go do a do a quick course or do something, a micro-credential, something small that kind of you learn something new and that can maybe kickstart your career back. Um, that's a really interesting sort of question. I think there's two aspects to this. One is essentially the, the skills aspect and you know, looking, working with the Lightcast data, what we kind of see is there is a general mix in any occupation of sort of enduring and um, sort of short-term skills. So for anybody who's had a period out of the labour force, there's a selection of skills in any job that you know, have, probably have a half-life of two to three years and quickly become redundant. So coming back in, if that individual isn't supported or A, conscious of and be supported to obtain those skills, they will face challenges coming into the labour market. And, and I think the other thing is those are the skills that quite often are called out in you know, particular selection criteria because those are the ones in demand. Yeah, you know, They're the differentiator skills because they're the new, the different from what we see in the existing stocks. So I think that can be a challenge. I think the other aspect is also just um, the point in career. And I think a lot of people are at that sort of point in their career some are looking to continue, but there's most likely that they're still actively engaged. I think people that have disengaged and then for a variety of reasons have need to look to re-engage um, will have certain obligations that they're looking for. So I think there it comes down to job design. And I think pleasingly what we're seeing is, particularly in this full employment context, employers are starting to think differently about job design. Skills are scarce, skills are rare. So rather than looking for unicorns that have everything, you know, it's employers are actually starting to go, well, I can't get this skill in the market, but I can get it in this person that may have left or retired. You know, why don't I craft a role that this person can really make the most of that individual skill? And I'll actually complement or augment that role with a range of other roles that bring the other skills uh, that that person may not need. So I think it's really about understanding your skill base and what is the scarce and valuable skills that are particularly tight in the labor market. Yeah, and also I think workplace flexibility is another area that employers are getting pushed uh, to. Um, I've got a specific question for, for Layla. Um, so we, and given that you're overseas, you might not get the opportunity to answer it again. So hi Layla, with regard to the four trends, just wondering if one of the reasons is because most jobs now require more skill sets than they used to. And this is because companies have to cut down headcount. For example, a web developer no longer just focuses on the technical side of things, but now needs presentation skills, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I totally agree that uh, many roles require more skills than they used to. I don't actually think it's necessarily directly related to reducing headcount. So um, we think of a lot of roles as hybridizing. So uh, again, maybe they were really technical track before now they're kind of a mix of technical and maybe some business strategy or technical and maybe some presenting or you know these other skills that are kind of coming in i think a lot of that is actually to do with the speed of with which technology is changing so um, i'll use a personal example my husband is a data scientist and when he started there was a lot of building models from scratch and that was recent you know five six years ago now it's a lot of off-the-shelf models but it's okay, what is the right data to put into this model? And how do I describe the output of this model to somebody else to say, hey, we need to spend more money on this part and not this part, you know? So it's the decision-making rather than the building the model from scratch that has become a core part of that job. And I think that's what we're seeing is a lot of technological changes complementing roles. So it's not automating away the role of a data scientist. It's just complementing that role and saying, well, we're going to push some of these other skills now in this role because we've taken away some of the hard part of, of building the model from scratch, for example. Dave, can I just also just share? So um, one, we, we've we sort of partnered with Infrastructure Australia over the last uh, couple of years to support their market capacity report. And one of the things we're essentially, one of the trends we saw there was again, sort of new or different skills um, emerging across a range of occupations. And what we're able to identify there was, was actually linking to the complexity of the work and the complexity of projects. And really it's that interdisciplinarity that was occurring. So as you know, the needs to actually 
deliver the outcomes and projects required a more diverse range of occupations to build a wider range of skills to enable these teams to come together and deliver on the complexity of the projects and work. So um, that's sort of another driver that we've been seeing in, in some industries. Great, thanks Hamish. Um, sorry, we have a specific question for you too, Hamish, um, from Ben. A few of those capstone jobs you talked about are in the public sector industry, social work, nursing, et cetera. We're already seeing a lack of supply for these workforces, which, and that workforce needs to grow in the future. Um, do you think mobility is an issue impacting recruitment and retention of these workforces? I think the presence of mobility is, is an issue in that I think what we're really seeing is um, challenges with the, the design of the jobs, the awards, the conditions, the nature of the, the work relative to what we see in the, the market. And um, I think, you know, certainly when we look across the, the human services um, and even health sort of sector, there are some severe challenges in how the workforce is constructed and set up to provide rewarding and meaningful careers. Um, commensurate with the, the capabilities and potential of the individuals that are required to fill them. So um, I wouldn't say mobility is necessarily sort of the, the challenge. I think the, the fact mobility is there just um, accentuates the inherent challenges that government has in competing for talent, but also designing services that enable people um, to achieve what they want in their careers. I think it's a fair uh, also to say though that there is there's a lot of um, mobility between similar occupations yeah. that are both in demand yeah. from different demand yeah. side factors that yeah. government has a role in as well. Yeah. So I think government's no, role think, in demand. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Particularly you know, if we're looking, you know, we've, we've stimulated, you know, we've got disability growth, we've got aged care growth, we've got uh, mental health, we've got our child youth services, we've got housing. There is significant overlap in the, the workforce across all of those. Um, um, so a, a useful question for people who are um, new to Lightcast data um, and a good one. Wondering for Layla, how is data captured in DIN markets that don't rely on digital job advertisements? Yeah, um, the short answer is we capture what we can and we think about the insights from that data maybe a little bit differently. So um, I think one of the things that you can look at um, in places that don't have as much online job posting are tech sector, for example, because you can imagine that the, the postings that are being posted online are probably the most technical jobs or you know, perhaps in, a, in the IT sector or ones that are more likely to sort of be in that kind of high skill level. And so you can understand trends in those sectors. Um, we also, you know, in order to understand if and when that's happening, we benchmark all of our data to public data sources to, to try to understand, well, what's the distribution of industries and occupations? How does that compare to employment? How does it compare to publicly available data on job vacancies? Um, and so we tend to have a pretty good sense of where uh, the data is really deep and where it's not. Um, and that's helpful. The last thing I'll say is even if places don't have as many postings online um, as, as sort of a, a gold standard set might, it's still really big data, right? You're still getting it in real time and it's still much, much bigger in terms of the number of observations that you can see uh, than, than survey data can be because it's really expensive to get that many observations in a survey format. So uh, we're still able to get a lot of information, I think uh, even in sort of markets that, that aren't as robust with online postings and the world is moving towards them. So I think it's, it's only gonna get better. Well, thanks Layla. I'd just like to squeeze in one uh, more question. Um, probably start with you, Layla. Thinking about the big four labor market trends, what strategies do you recommend for individuals and government to enable adaptation to these trends? Whew, that's a good one. Um, for individuals, I think um, it's helpful to sort of talk with maybe your internal learning and development folks, maybe your manager, maybe your coworkers, think about, well, what are some of the skills I've learned in the last five years on the job? And what am I, what am I seeing that could help maybe upskill myself? And maybe what opportunities are there for me to take a class or talk to somebody who has that skill in more detail and sort of be a little bit proactive about bringing some of those four big trend skills into your role, because they're going to be there probably whether you 
whether you invest in them or not. Um, for governments, I think it's recognizing that um, skill building can happen not only in the not only through education and training, but also through the workforce and maybe thinking a little bit about how to um, tie better together uh, corporations who are interested in upskilling their workforces and public education provision that can maybe uh, sort of connect the dots and maybe think of some new, you know, publicly available credentials that can help across a wider range of workforce uh, folks get some of these skills. Um, anything from you? Hamish? You're on mute. Sorry, it had to happen once. Yeah, it's good for the last couple of minutes. Um, I don't think there's much to add to, to Lyle's. I think that's um, pretty sort of comprehensive. I, I, think it, I think the other thing I would sort of say is those trends will change. So it, it's important to sort of acknowledge those trends, but what's really needed across organisations is um, skill agility. And it's actually about helping people move rapidly when they see an opportunity for, for new skills, new applications in an organisation, having the flexibility in your, your L&D pathways uh, to respond. So those are obviously the trends we're seeing at the moment, but you know, I think each year we'll see, we see different, different sort of trends. Um, uh, thanks, Hamish. Thanks, Leila. Um, there's a, quite a few questions we didn't get to. Reasonably, they're sort of, you know, interesting follow-up questions about has now done any analysis about this um, probably probably not because we've only just recently started working with this data from Lightcast but happy to have a follow-up discussion with any of the people with those questions um, yeah we're really excited about the insights that it can bring into for both um, policy makers for employers and also for education providers um, it's a it's a great untapped data set so um, thank you very much Hamish Thank you, Layla, for um, being available at a, an Australian friendly time. Um, thank you all uh, for coming. And uh, the, I think the recording will be made available if you would like to share it with colleagues. So thanks very much. Thank you.